Welcome to Strange Familiars, covering a range of topics from the paranormal. Cryptids, mythology, the occult, hauntings, UFOs, weird history, and folklore. Wherever you are listening to Strange Familiars, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or any other service, please subscribe and click the like button, and share the Strange Familiars pages and stories on Facebook and other social media. If you have experienced something strange, or if you know a story you would like us to cover, email strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars. And of course you can always find us at strangefamiliars.com. Welcome to Strange Familiars. Tonight we're going to be talking about very early paranormal photography. Just a few examples. We're not going to get into the modern stuff because I think digital photography changes everything. I think that Photoshop changes everything. I'm not an expert in Photoshop. I can't look at a photo and say, this has been Photoshopped. This hasn't been Photoshopped. There are people who can yeah, I think there's varying amounts of obviousness depending on your level yeah, of expertise. Yeah, that's true. There are some that are very obviously Photoshop, <laughs> uh-uh. but uh, as someone who's very good at it, I can't, you know, I, I can't pick that. Up. I know there are people who can, but I'm not that guy. I think technology changes everything. I think it's changed photography. I think it changes what we're able to do. You could modify pictures in many ways, whether it's by adding just computer generated images or by modifying somebody could make a puppet and you know modify it digitally. Uh, there's there's all kinds of ways you you can manipulate things digitally. Interestingly, though, there don't seem to be too many legit photos from the past of paranormal things. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of. There's, a, there, there's some of the sort of ghost photos are sort of in yeah, that maybe category. Yeah, there's some sort of hazy ectoplasm of right. on stairs that could. But but most of them are, and they're not as early as some of these that we'll be talking about right. tonight. Specifically, exactly. this amazing so, photo. There's nothing. Conf- I mean, there's really nothing confirmed. That you know, the the, the there's the, the famous Loch Ness monster one that looks like oh yeah, you know, <laughs> like it was painted like, on. That that's not been proved real or fake. It, you know, that's just a picture of something in in Loch Ness. Patterson Gimlin, which we won't be getting into. I mean, Patterson Gimlin's a show to itself. There's uh, as many people think it's fake as think it's real, both laymen and experts probably more think it's fake, if I have to be honest. I personally think it's not fake, but it doesn't It doesn't matter. There's For every person you can say they think it's real, you can absolutely find a person that says it's fake, whether they're an expert or a layman. Speaking of photographs, before we get into it, Blind Joe Parsons, a show we did a little while back about mm-hmm. the blinded Civil War soldier. You've got some new information, which we're not revealing tonight. But that there will be sort of an expose on him in a... A military-themed publication. A military-themed I'll, publication. I'll, I'll tell people when it's out. Yeah. So, so you're writing this article uh, with the help of someone who's helping you... With the help of the editor. Doing some research yeah. on, on... So we're Parsons. kind of working together. He's more of the military side of it. And... and we're finding out some neat things. One of the things that we can reveal is we found out he lived a lot closer to us than we thought, which is really cool. Yeah, and so we got together today to Weisberg, Maryland, which is only like a half an hour away from where we live. Yeah. We've been there before, and I didn't know it. We've been through there probably any number of times. It just didn't sound familiar when I looked it up in the census records. I just thought, honestly, I thought it was like a neighborhood in Baltimore or something. Yeah, yeah. And, well, they didn't list that. They listed him as being from Baltimore. yeah. And he was from very, very close to us, which makes the story even that much cooler. Yeah. Because we thought, oh, isn't it neat this photo came back to, to Red Lion and we're so near Baltimore and he was mm-hmm. from Baltimore. Well, he was way closer to us. He was much closer. He was, he's closer to us than he is to Baltimore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, th- that was very, very cool. 
when the Joe Parsons article is ready, I'll let everybody know. If you're not on that particular week, I'll let everybody know. A lot of neat stuff we're finding out about Blind Joe. And the ever-changing but static nature of history and its malleability. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of which, history and its malleability. There is a Bigfoot photo that is going around. I, I see it being passed around Facebook a lot now. I don't think anybody shared it to the Strange Familiars group, but it it was shared to the Where Did This Road Go group on oh, okay. Facebook. So some people might be, I've seen this already. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. And I'll put a link to this in the description. It's supposed to be the, the oldest known photo of Bigfoot. And uh, the, the article is published on ancientorigins.net. Again, I'll put the link in the show notes for that. I immediately had a problem with this, and I'm, I don't know as much about antique photography as you. The minute I saw it, I had a problem with it. Didn't look right to me. Now, the, the original link I saw had so many pop-ups that I, that I never got to see the back of the photo. Mm-hmm. You can see at the, at the link I have, I could see the back of the photo. My original question was, where's the mount to the photo? There's no, there's a, I didn't know if it was just scanned in or they took mm-hmm. a photo of the photo. I wanted to see the whole thing. Well, there's writing on the back of it, so there, there is no mount to this mm-hmm. photo, and we'll get to that. The photo purports to show a Bigfoot creature taken by, was it Trappers? Yeah, I yes. think, yeah. Trappers sure. in British Columbia in 1894. Interestingly enough, you found a wild man report from the area? Yeah, from 1894. 1894. So when you first see a wild man report in old papers, it could be a Bigfoot. Yeah, because it, in this one, he said he was naked and he had long black hair and a right, beard and down. It, and I was like, And Whoa. a lot of times, uh, I think, and I put the theory out there that a beard down to your knees or a beard down to your waist is sort of code word for wasn't wearing any clothes. We don't want to say he's, he's naked, you know, this, so mm-hmm. you so the reader can imagine the beard was covering up mm-hmm. his, his naughty bits. <laughs> So when you read these initial, you know, wild man things, you don't you don't often know. So you have to dig further if you can. A lot of times it's just that initial article and you're not. But he made the news for like a couple of weeks. People right. were really interested in where he was staying and how he was getting food. One person purported that about the same time that he shows up, all of his milk is uh, running out on his, in his cows. Which would not be unusual for these report, these Bigfoot reports. I have that in Pennsylvania reports, in my Pennsylvania book, where people say they were, you know, suckling their cows and stuff. Until they see him with a gun. And right. they're like, ah, so probably not him. That's what I was him. getting to. If you, <laughs> if you follow the, these articles, if they keep popping up, sometimes, you know, what seems like, well, maybe that's a Bigfoot creature. That's kind of, that sounds like Bigfoot behavior. One way or another, uh, sometimes they'll prove themselves human. They'll either get taken to a county home mm-hmm. or they'll speak to someone. Mm-hmm. Uh, or in this case, this a guy caught him using a gun. <laughs> yeah. Not a Bigfoot. So we can eliminate that as being, you know, confirmation of whatever. But in this, in this little photo. town, I don't know what the population of this tiny little town in British Columbia was at the time, but I can't imagine it was very uh, right. What is it, Lillooet? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but that's okay. We'll get close. Sorry, Canadian listeners. Right. So it purports to show this photo taken by trappers near Lillooet. Immediately, I went, Mm-mm, nope, something's wrong here. Why would trappers in British Columbia be carrying a camera around with everything they have to carry, all the supplies they have to carry? They're going to have to carry a camera around with them. And keep glass plates from breaking. Right. Right. Because that, that's the negative format at the time. Right? Yeah. Is that, so that's that's what we're talking about, glass mm-hmm. glass plates. But I was thinking, okay, maybe it's a really early brownie camera they're trying to because it looks like a snapshot it doesn't look like a composed photo uh, no it looks you like you said it looks like it comes from much later you thought yeah like if if you told me hey when do you think that photo is from whether whether i think it's really a big foot or not when do you think that photo is from i'd say mm, 50s 60s right to me i thought 20s because like, mm-hmm. like, we get a lot of collections of like and 20s is where you start getting the snapshots yeah you know because people have access to yeah they have these brownie yeah. cameras and, and you so get forth. to see a lot of really poorly crafted photographs exactly at that time. and you don't see as many poorly crafted photographs exactly. in the victorian era exactly because professionals are doing them so again i couldn't read the whole article and at first i said nope no, i just don't believe a trapper is going to carry an amateur photo rig around with them with everything else he has to carry it just doesn't seem right to me i was able to read the whole article eventually 
and it shows what purports to be the back of the photo, which gives more information. It says it's taken from a glass plate negative, which you pointed this out. Why would you write that on the back of a photo? I've never written on the back of a Polaroid. Polaroid. <laughs> exactly. I, and I didn't even think of that. This, yeah. is, this is why it's like, you know, you, you put two, two sort of minds The handwriting together. doesn't look old. Yeah. I, I never wrote on the back of a, a photo what camera I took and what kind of negative it had. I've never, I, it's very rare to even hear somebody or, you know, see on the back that whole story. Right. But to, to put the format, it's like a uh, pinhole camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Disc, uh, you know, Kodak disc. Never popped open a daguerreotype and seen a little piece of paper that says daguerreotype. Daguerreotype. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's suspect. The whole story on the back is suspect. But given that it's a glass plate negative, it's addressed in the article. Oh, this was this was a professional photographer that took this. It had to have been. I have so many problems with that. Yeah, why would he have come along on a trapping mission unless he was a very well-renowned photographer who was doing like a documentarian work on occupations or something like right. that but if that was the case where are the other photos yeah there's no context for it it's just one photo he, he went one out blurry... on this expedition and took one photo for <laughs> you know however long you're out with trappers. and he didn't bother to compose it very well no it's very poorly composed now it has to be a professional photography which is nice because you can check those records oh yeah oh, <laughs> and yeah. the guy's name is supposed to be holiday right and in the British Columbia uh, directory, you can see how many professional photographers there are in all of British Columbia at that time, in specifically the year 1894. And there are 30. 30 in all of the whole territory of British Columbia. The whole territory. 30 professional photographers. And there is one that is based near Lillooet. Okay. And, and his name is? Well, it's two brothers. Names I've seen them named either Cumming or Cummings. Okay. And they had a, the Cummings Brothers studio from 1892 to 1895, although I've seen some photographs that were like a little bit later than that. But all the examples of their, photo of their photography is amazing. It doesn't look anything like this. Beautifully composed. Beautifully composed. Wonderful depth to them. In focus, amazing details, nice quality. Right. Uh, what you would expect. Of any of these, how many photographers? 30 photographers. Of any of these 30 photographers, professional photographers in all of British Columbia, are any of them named Holiday? No. Not, not even one. close. No. <laughs> so now we have to have a professional photographer that comes to British Columbia, brings his camera and all his glass negatives. <laughs> glass being fragile. How many glass negatives do we have? I have a few. A yeah. few. Yeah. Dozens, probably, right? Mm -hmm. How many are broken <laughs> or were broken when we got them? Oh, I do have some broken ones, yeah. yeah a lot of them were broken. Yeah. I mean, a, lot, a lot of them we didn't, we and threw we out. we didn't bring them to the tundra. <laughs> no, no. No, o on the back of a donkey or in a cart or however <laughs> these would have had to be transferred, uh, you know, across. Attached to a snowshoe. <laughs> right, yeah. It boggles the mind. So this photographer from somewhere else comes brings all his photography supplies with him because there was you couldn't go to Walmart and buy your uh, photography supplies. You're going to bring them in with you or have them, you know, brought there by stagecoach or however people brought things, ship things the to the Along with the chemicals this, this that you need. Exactly. And then go out with a bunch of trappers mm -hmm. and take one really, really cruddy picture. That's not close to the thing that you're trying to get a picture of. It's not of. close. So this purports to show a Bigfoot creature. It, it's hard to tell what it is. To me, it looks like it's got fur on it, not hair. That's, you know, beyond the point. The feet are out of the frame. So he didn't frame this creature or whatever it was on the ground. He didn't frame it well. Um, there's kind but, of some pixelated mountains in the back. Yeah. And like you and said, there's, there's, like, is there a rip in it? Is that supposed to be a rip in the there, top? And or there's, like no, a, there's no depth. It all looks flat. Yeah, like, it looks is very it flat. You... It looks... And it looks like a snapshot to me. This just looks like a snapshot. Like a blurry snapshot from the 60s. Like. And it looks like something somebody found maybe and went, oh, look, look at that on the ground there. Let's make up a story about this. There's just too many red flags. There's too many red flags if you know photography. You start going, I don't Why think so. Why come up so. with a hoax where people can easily research it? Don't come up with like some vague name. Oh, because it, they think they did research it. You know what I'm saying? Like, the research they did is enough for them. Oh, yeah. the glass plate negative. Well, if you look up antique photography, you'll find things about glass plate negatives. Oh, so that there it is. 
Well, they don't tell the size of the photograph, so we don't know what format it was taken in. The number of photos we have from the 1890s, make a guess, in the house. Most of them are mounted cabinet cards, portraits from photo, from professional studios. Yeah, so, so most of them are almost, I mean, all of them are probably from professional photographers one way yeah. or another. How many total do you think? I mean, just make a guess at how many. Thousands. Photos, thousands of photos we have from the 1890s. How many are not on a mount of some sort? Less than 20. Less than 20 out of out of thousands we have are not on a mount. Sometimes that's because it just pulled up from the glue. Yes, yeah, yeah, sometimes <laughs> it's because it came off a mount. Mm-hmm. The fact that this one photo, doesn't, yeah. so it could have its story written on the back, uh-huh. isn't on a mount. You could have written the story on the back of the mount if it was... Yeah, exactly. It's To me, that's you another... You could have gotten a mount and taken off the old photo. If you wanted or to hoax it... Or glued your fake over top. Yeah, if you wanted to make a convincing fake, mm-hmm. it, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, yeah. This is not convincing. The other problem I have with this, and it is a big, big problem as far as I'm concerned, the provenance of this photo, as related in the article, says it came from Tom Biscardi through Lauren Coleman, and then uh, then it was published by, I think, Lauren Coleman and, and this, this website or something. Well, how did the initial guy get it? Someone sent it to him. So, so it's just some guy sent it to him. Some guy found it and sent it, to, sent it to Tom Biscardi. You don't know who Tom Biscardi is, but I know who Tom Biscardi is. And Let me guess, he's a well-known photographer who knows everything about photography. No, he is well-known. <laughs> yeah, but what's he well-known for? He's well-known for hoaxing. Oh, so Tom Biscardi was involved in the famous Georgia Bigfoot hoax where they uh, stuffed a Bigfoot costume with road gel and various animal parts and uh. stuck horse teeth in its mouth and put it in a freezer. I remember because we were waiting for the big reveal. Yes, yes. and that's, It'll just be a couple more days. That's always a warning sign. Yeah. Anytime someone says it's a couple more days, that's... Uh, like if I found an alien, I wouldn't take a, like a hazy picture of it and then say... Just wait. Saturday afternoon, I'm going to show you everything about it. If you just hang on and wait, and by the way, pay for access to my website in the meantime, because it's going to be a huge reveal. Just wait, though. Yeah, this way to the egress. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) That's exactly what that is. It's complete bunk. Anytime someone says that, if you if you have something and you're holding it back, it's like, just wait, just wait a few more days. We're going to change the world next week, <laughs> but we ha- you have to hold on until then. You're going to be the first people to see it, so you might right. as well sign up. So this is Tom Biscardi, and, and that's not the only hoax he's been involved in. Why do people keep take me remotely seriously? For- I, I have no clue. I have, well, no I, clue. The, I have a, a one-strike policy for known hoaxers. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people do. He's got some money, I think, so I guess people keep giving him a chance or I don't know. I don't know. But anyway. When when you don't have the person there to ask questions like, hey, where'd you get this? Right. That would be an important question. Or was this in your family? Or what do you know about the photograph? Well, there's a lot of questions we have about this photograph. So it goes through uh, from the the one guy to Tom Biscardi and Tom Biscardi gives it to Lauren Coleman. For credibility. Lauren Coleman runs a Bigfoot museum in Maine or something. He's written books about this stuff since forever. He's very well respected. And that's all I'll say about Lauren Coleman. He's been on. That's all I'll say about Lauren Coleman. Okay. (laughs) He's very well respected in the Bigfoot world. To me, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's in the hands of someone mildly respectable because it started well, Tom Biscardi's before him in the chain. Mm-hmm. So anything after Pom- Tom Biscardi in the chain is doesn't matter. Yeah. It's it's Tom Biscardi's involved. You can't have a negative and then no matter how many positives you have after it. Right. Doesn't eliminate so, the negative. Was this a Photoshop job? I don't know. I can't I'm not an, a Photoshop it's expert like, as it's I said. It's not even it's not even high quality enough to be Photoshop. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look like photographs of the time. Like you said, photographs of the time were really clear. I feel like that's a disservice to early photography where people think that perhaps it was like, in very early days, it wasn't even a matter of clarity so much as fixing the image and making it last for a longer time, even with the very first primitive right. stabs of photography. But as soon as you get the daguerreotype, it's beautiful. It's crisp. It shows detail that when it's blown up is amazing. And the photographs you were showing me of the photographers around British Columbia at the time. Yeah, they're 
Beautiful. I mean, they're they're much more akin to like an Ansel Adams kind of quality. I was going to say that. They, that's what they really reminded me because a lot of them are glaciers and people standing next to glaciers. Just crisp detail. There's depth to them. And high contrast, black and white with clarity. Right, but not so high contrast that it looks like a photocopy, which the the, the photo yeah. we're talking about almost looks like. A... Yeah, this looks like several generations, like a 60s art project turned into like a weird uh, 80s pixelated thing that yeah, then yeah, became just... like, like... And some of that might be we're looking on a monitor. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt on that stuff. I'd like but to see so someone much... hold that photo. There's so much other doubt. I need to know the size. I need to... If it's a glass plate negative... Did they print it from the negative? Is that what they're uh-huh. claiming? Because if so, how'd the writing get there? Because the yeah. writing doesn't isn't going to be on the negative. If they didn't print it from the negative, you know what they should have written under amount? glass plate photograph hoax. <laughs> <laughs> that way you'd know. That way you'd know. Yeah. Why is it composed so poorly? This is a professional photographer. They didn't with just, one shot. <laughs> yeah, they didn't take snapshots. They composed things. Think of. Um, the very famous photo in Gettysburg of the Confederate soldier at Devil's Den. Mm-hmm. Completely posed. Yeah. It's supposed to be a Confederate sharpshooter at Devil's Den. It's known that they they drug this guy. They drug his body <laughs> like 20, 30 yards or something mm-hmm. from across the way. To get a good shot. Posed him with his leg up mm-hmm. on the rock. And uh, supposedly he's a Confederate sharpshooter. He's not even has the right kind of rifle for that. Completely posed photograph. Still trying to document something. Still trying to document Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. It's real in that it was a real dead soldier, and it was at Gettysburg. And there were sharpshooters there. Right. <laughs> but it's a completely composed photograph because he was a professional photographer, and he wanted to make a composed photograph. He wanted a good photograph, not just, eh, I'm going to fire off a snapshot. Yeah, I don't think that idea has even occurs to people at that point. No, it's too valuable. The whole process is too valuable. Yeah, and I think we've, we're so far removed from that because you can go to a wedding and take a thousand photographs yourself. Yeah, how many How many photos do we take a day on yeah. our cell phones? Just, I mean... And you're going to get some good the, quality ones. The idea that you could even take one photo a day randomly at will to them back to then it, it yeah. would be like, if you're not a professional photographer, it would be crazy. So the whole process was precious. It was expensive. And honestly, an expedition leaving with a photographer would have made the news, I think, in small towns. Probably. Like an expedition set off today at such and such a place yes. with such and such a photographer. With, with professional photographer Holiday who flew in. From, <laughs> flew in. <laughs> <laughs> with professional photographer Holiday who had made the hard track in. Yeah, who traveled 2,000 miles from the nearest place with Glass plate negatives. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It probably would have made the news. I hate to be the guy who crushes people's expectations and hopes and so forth. But this is, hey, I can't say what's in the photo. Maybe it's a real Bigfoot in the photo. I wasn't yeah, there. Maybe the date's wrong. I could put the date's wrong. I, <laughs> yeah, I will, yeah, I, I will confidently weigh in and say that's that's not from when they're saying it's from. Mm. It doesn't make sense in any way. Prove me wrong. But until then, I think evidence is on our side of saying very wrong. That picture is very wrong. Date's wrong on that. But that's the psychological weight of photography. And it was, it was heavier, I think, uh, before Photoshop and especially in earlier times. And to be a true representation of, of life. Right. We'll get into that with the Cottingley Fairy photos. While we're at the break here, I did want to thank our patrons and, of course, mention if you'd like to help Strange Familiars, if you'd like to help us make the show and help the show to continue, you can become a patron yourself at patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. $3 a month gets you extra shows. We try to do one full extra show a month for our patrons, and there's other reward levels there as well. You can get things like t-shirts, stickers, pins, copies of my book, and more. Again, that's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars.
these photographs were accepted as real, 100% real at the time. They were declared real. In this article, I believe, they, they say they believe they're real. And I have to take my glasses off to read because okay. I'm that old. <laughs> what year is this that you're This is 1927. So this is, well, this is 10 years or so after the photographs have been taken. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is they're often called the Cottingley photos, I, I believe. They're photographs of little girls with uh, fairies around them. And, and I'm sorry, Joshua Cutchin, I think he hates these photos because he hates the, the sort of Victorian pretty little tiny fairy with wings, that whole image of them. In the Victorian era, that was king, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fairies were much different things in you know, medieval times and, and these old tales. They were, they were uh, much, often much creepier and much scarier. The Victorians, for all the harshness of the Victorians, they kind of turn like, they turned Santa from this sort of uh, imposing... Punitive. Yeah, <laughs> guy to this... He, that's when he became the fat, you know, jolly guy on the Coca-Cola bottles and stuff. And they turned fairies from these creepy baby stealers, you know, who lived underground and took all different kinds of forms from, you know, just weird regular human forms to little hairy people to giant big, you know, hairy creatures. They had all these different forms and they, they took them and turned them into these cute little tinkerbells that fly around. Yeah, very girls. feminine version of them. So if you haven't seen the photos, the, the Cottingling fairy photos, they're, they're very, very popular. Yeah, they're sort of like just the, when you think of sort of Edwardian girls, mm -hmm. they're just like the quintessential Edwardian girls playing outside. And they're, but they're surrounded by these. But they're surrounded by real fairies. fairies. <laughs> So this is from the Gazette, Montreal, Canada, February 3rd, 1927. Theosophist has spirit pictures, fairy photographs believed genuine by experts, brought on Samaria. Bringing with him a complete theory of gnomes, sylphs, and other etheric and astral forms, E.L. Gardner, secretary of the English Theosophical Society, landed in New York today from Samaria with the announced intention of delivering a series of lectures in various cities on the coming of the fairies. He brings with him purported photographs of fairies taken by two young girls in Yorkshire, England, which, he said, many reputable photographers have declared to be free from any faking evidence, as far as any photographer can tell. Mr. Gardner, upon whose investigation Sir Arthur Conan Doyle based his book called The Coming of the Fairies, exhibited the fairy photographs today at his room in the Hotel Belmont. He told the history of the photographs, saying that Francis Griffiths, her cousin Elsie had taken them at Cottingley, a little village near Bradford in Yorkshire, in 1917. Both children, he said, were psychic and often spoke of the fairies in the glen near their aunt's home. They were enabled to take the pictures, he explained, because one of the girls was a good materializing medium, or in other words, was surrounded by an aura which rendered the fairies visible on the camera plate. Mr. Gardner outlined a theory today that fairies and other unseen spirits are the agents who construct and color plants, shrubs, and flowers. 1927. We already knew better. Yeah. <laughs> he predicted that Sir Jagadis Chandra Basso, the Indian plant physiologist, who believes that plants have nervous systems, would come around to his theory. The first lecture by Mr. Gardner will be tomorrow night in the Engineering Society's Auditorium, 29 West 29th Street. So this is 1927. World War I is over. <laughs> We're out of World War I now. The dawn of everything. I mean, this is well past the Victorian age. We're well into the Edwardian age. Well, we're past Edward, and now we're, we're like flapper time now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we're... <laughs> yeah, we, so this is like... A, the 20s is a real time of progress. Right. And we these should be photographs giving... look ridiculous. Yeah, they really do. They're completely ridiculous. You look at them now and you go, how did anyone for a second think those were real? Okay, anyone. I'm going to say something really offensive now. <laughs> go ahead. Can we not extrapolate that <laughs> to maybe more recent sightings well maybe yes. even the patterson gimlin film hey you know what i mean like so maybe in 10 years you'll look at that and go 
what was I thinking? Now we have this technology and now it just looks... Maybe. In the same way Maybe. that, we, you and know, like you see when you saw Star Wars the first time, you thought it was the most cutting edge, amazing things ever. And you mm -hmm. watch it now and you go, this looks incredibly dated. Wow, you're going to... Now, you, so now, now I've you're, pissed you, off you both pissed Bigfoot. pissed off the Amish, the, the Bigfoot, Bigfoot people, <laughs> and the Star Wars fans? Oh my God. This is... I, and you know what? I probably got some of the photography facts wrong, so... Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> yes. the, the well, actually comments are going to be all over the place. On this one. I'm really worried about the Amish, though. <laughs> uh, no. So, yes, maybe maybe in 10 years we will we will be able to look at uh, at Patterson Gimlin. I think Patterson Gimlin, isn't, I mean, I don't want to do any more on Patterson Gimlin, mm -hmm. but just briefly. It's the fact that we're still debating it, it for, you know, 50 years later is pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, well, this debate in the 20s should have been over in 1869 when spirit photography was officially debunked. Right. And some of those other older ghost photos are way more convincing. Oh, yeah, than yeah. Than these fairy photos. I mean, these... So what they were were paper cutouts, right? Yeah. From a known book. Yeah. Like a published book that <laughs> yeah. had pictures of fairies in it. Yeah, like a children's book. They yeah. cut the pictures out with scissors, presumably. Yeah, it's almost like paper dolls, like fairy paper dolls. That's what it looks like. And just place them around like they were flying around the girl. Mm -hmm. Whose these... father was an amateur photographer who did glass plate photography. Right. And these were accepted as real. Now, I will say part of that, I think, was the psychology of photography. Because it was used to document so much, and because it... There's a bias. There. It had really replaced, like, look at portrait painting after photography. You know, the, the longer photography is around. Now, photography starts when? Like, uh, I mean, the conventional dates about 1839. Right. Really starts getting popular. Mid 1800s. Gets to the point where people are handing out portraits of themselves, essentially as calling cards mm -hmm. with, with CDVs, right? At that point, look at what happens to portrait photography. It's it's out the window. I mean, you mean portrait painting. Yeah, por I'm sorry. Yes, portrait painting. Yeah, and then we we start to see like Van Gogh and painters whose the people aren't natural colors anymore. You're right. seeing greens as part of people's because they're allowing themselves to not. Yeah, they're they're done with realism at yeah. that point. The camera can do realism better than most painters could ever try. So realism's over. That's impressionism starts. Cubism starts. Surrealism, you know, the, all these movements which push painting into areas that photography can't go, start. But photography becomes the way you document people. Now you're documenting. Now you're questioning science if you question a photo. Right. So because it was used in this way, because it was used to document, I think people were sort of predisposed almost to believe photographs. Well, it's in a photograph. It must be real. Even though it looks completely hokey. It looks completely flat, completely faked. And you go really like no one and part of that could be just the innocence of girlhood in that time period where you wouldn't have attributed um nefarious motives to to children sure, they yeah. wouldn't have they wouldn't have and i don't think it probably was their idea i think they probably did this as a joke you think it was a joke i think they did it to see if they could get the fairies in the picture and then I think it was done because didn't they weren't they they were related somehow to the Theosophical Society? I don't know if it was their parents or yeah, something. but I you I think they were just playing around and the father took pictures and then when they were printed and they were you could really see the the paper fairies really well. They thought, oh, we are having this lecture on fairies coming up. Maybe I mean maybe that's the way it was done, but I believe there at some point there is a definite like hoax intention behind mm -hmm. it. The, these Cottingley photos are just. They're silly. I mean, I'll, I'll try to. I'll, I'll put links up to them, or I'll put them up in the description. And it's it's amazing that people would declare. I mean, they're in the newspaper article. So, it so shouldn't have even been a debate, right? The articles you're going to read in a little bit are from the what, 1860s. 1860s, and they've already sort of sorted it out. Yeah. Here's a, another one from 1922, and I will put this photograph in the show notes. That a ghost can be photographed was seemingly proved in Chicago the other day. The result is shown above. The ghost was materialized by Elizabeth Allen Thompson, a member of the International Society for Psychic Research. Excuse me. Psychical Research. The International <laughs> Society for Psychical Research. 
who has just accepted the offer of the Scientific American for $2,500 for the first psychic phenomenon produced before a committee named by that publication and under its test conditions. So this is uh, supposed to be a real photograph of a ghost. I'm just going to pass it to you and we'll get your impressions. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. It looks like it was drawn in afterwards. Or Yeah, it's, there's something hinky about it. Oh, yeah. It doesn't even look like a human. It's it's like a... I love the the people that are standing directly next to it, like within two feet of it. The one person looks like very nonplussed for having a ghost <laughs> right next to her. And the other one's kind of like, oh, Susie showed up. You know, like it doesn't... It's yeah, not like... It's probably some sort of stage magic or something going on there. I mean, it's, it's, it was probably from a... Th- it's probably a shot from a theater production, I think. Mm-hmm. With this weird little drawn-in um, ghost person, yeah, who looks a lot like a nun, I wouldn't have handed out the twenty five hundred dollars for that. I don't believe she got twenty five hundred dollars for that. I believe she said she was going to enter their contest, basically, like mm. she was going to be the one to, to prove it. That's the way I read it. Anyway. Oh, okay, third runner-up, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Not too many years before that, in nineteen eighteen, we're kind of going back backwards through time here. <laughs> In 1918, and these were this was published all over the place. I mean, I found this in no less than 20 newspapers. So this was published like nationwide. This is one of those stories that just so that just tidbits. hits like the AP and yeah. then just goes. So this would not have been, you know, some obscure thing that that nobody saw. This would have been, you know, read all over the United States. This is the first one I found. It's from the Russell Register, Seal, Alabama, 24th of May, 1918. Ghost photographs. Those who are looking for novelty in photography may find it interesting to take a photograph of a ghost. Of course, it will be a fake ghost. Get a friend to pose as the ghost and expose your negative, allowing one-third of the proper time. Then let the ghost leave the room and expose the negative for the remaining two-thirds of the proper exposure. Of course, the camera must not be moved, and the ghost may be draped in white. Ooh. So here's instructions. Here's a how-to. Instructions to fake ghost photos. In 1918, and how many have you seen fake like that? I mean, that were obviously fake like that. We come across them occasionally, just, you know, and you don't know whether it was a, a poor exposure if somebody was doing that, just playing yeah. around and trying to make a ghost. But uh, we come across them here and there in, in photographs. Some cool double exposures. Yeah. And... How often and how many of those photographs were passed off as, as real photos of ghosts? A lot. I mean, I, I've seen a lot over the years. But... Even this, going back further in time. So just post-Civil War, probably the most famous spirit photographer, Mumler. There's, you can look it up. There's a lot of exhibitions of the work. Regardless of whether it's real or not, and this is maybe where I kind of land with you, it's really interesting. Like, these spirit photographs are really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're really cool. They're really interesting. It was what was going on in society was really interesting at the time. I think because photography was this new science, they thought like in the same way that they thought that if they just tweaked the radio the right way, they'd be able to speak to the dead. Mm -hmm. I think they thought if they, you know, if they just had the right conditions, we could get photographs of the dead, you know, and and, and why not? I mean, look how amazing it is that you can capture one tiny little moment of time. If you can capture one tiny little moment of time while it's happening, it's not a huge leap of faith that you'd be able to capture a moment of time of someone who's not alive, right? Right, right. Or if there's these uh, etheric forms that we can't see, mm-hmm. this thing that can capture, you know, every every little detail, maybe. maybe and because it's them. kind of, at this point, it's it's in the hands of people who are professionals, and it's not well, the, the whole scientific process isn't well understood. As far as making photographs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it isn't. At a, we're not at a time where the average person has a, has a camera. Right. I mean, and let's say all modern technology goes away tomorrow and we're left with 1800s technology. How many people alive today will be able to make a photograph? Yeah, not that many. Not that many. We go back to the professionals, essentially, the people that were trained to do it. Mm-hmm. So these were the, this was Mummer, you said? Uh, Mumler. Mumler. Yeah. So he's one of two alleged spirit photographers who were arrested in New York. This is an article from the Buffalo Commercial 13th of April, 1869, from New York, photograph swindlers. 
Two alleged spirit photographers were yesterday arrested and brought before Judge Dowling at the tombs on a charge of practicing gross deceptions upon the public and swindling people out of their money on false pretenses. Their examination was set down for Friday when some interesting developments are anticipated. Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> interesting developments. Oh, uh, did they throw that in there? Was that a... Uh... Oh, yeah, that's nice, right? <laughs> I wonder what will develop. <laughs> Why, photos of ghosts, no doubt. Yeah. Pretend ghosts. And the, mo- the one of the most famous per- people to be hoaxed in this way was Mary Todd Lincoln, who went in under assumed name. And all of a sudden, Lincoln w- appeared behind her. Really? Yeah. She was hoaxed by a, a spirit photographer. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, are I there photographs of this? There's a photograph of Mary Todd Lincoln with a, a spirit image a of sort Lincoln. Of ghostly version a, of Lincoln. a ghostly version of Lincoln in the background. They said she went in under an assumed name, and they didn't even know that. They said she was looking for like for another relative to kind of show up. And... This to me sounds like the the kind of story that's like Houdini, right? And his wife. They proved they were Houdini was like really exposing spiritualists, mm-hmm. people having seances and stuff. He was exposing how they were doing it. He had a some sort of code word or something that he was going to tell his wife like, after he died. After yeah. he died, so she could go to a seance and she would know it was him. And it's often reported that like this, like they, there was a stance and and this this the spirit or whatever brought forth this word and it knew it and and like it, like she became a believer afterwards and stuff. But then if you dig a little more, it's like the guy did have a way to access that information. I don't know if it was a letter that was written to him mm-hmm. or something. Like somebody found like, eh. but the story that sticks is the one that the more mysterious one, the one like oh like you know. They had this code word, and even though even though Houdini debunked all these all these spiritualists, like in the end, you know she was believer because the spirit gave him the word. But dig a little more, and it's like eh, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. The, I think the interesting part of this story is that Barnum, probably because he was mad that he hadn't thought of it, <laughs> <laughs> decides he's going to help debunk these spirit ph- photographs. And so he has a really famous photographer from New York named Bogardus, whose pictures are, you know, they're in line with like Brady. He's he's a very common photographer of celebrities and politicians in that era. He does a fake spirit photo of Barnum with a spirit behind him. Of Barnum himself. Yeah. Oh, that'd be a neat photo to have. Yeah. <laughs> and he helps to try to disprove it by showing that you can replicate this process on your own. So uh, they were... So they go to trial. They go to trial on this. And I can read this article from the New York Daily Her- Herald. They got a quick trial. This is like a week later. The mayor's marshal after two spirit photographers, their arrest and arraignment at the tombs. A case rather out of the stereotype track of police court cases came up yesterday afternoon before Judge Downing at the tombs. When W. Mumler and W.H. Silver, alleged spirit photographers at number 630 Broadway, were arrested on a charge of perpetrating a gross deception and swindle upon the public. The preliminaries of the arrest are being told in the affidavits made against the accused. Being unusual samples of wonderful diffuseness in the matter of words we give below only their substance but omitting no material facts. The first affidavit is that of Marshal Joseph H. Tooker of the mayor's office. He states that upon complaint of a Mr. P. V. Hickey, that a gross imposition was being practiced at the place named above and money obtained under the pretense of giving spirit photographs, he proceeded to investigate the matter. On the 16th of last March, he went to the photograph gallery referred to and inquired for a Mr. Silver, the alleged proprietor. A gentleman, giving this as his name, announced himself. The marshal stated that he was skeptical as to believing that the likeliness of deceased persons could be produced by photographic process on cards with living subjects. He asked if it was possible such likenesses could be produced. Mr. Silver said that Mr. Mumler, an operator and medium upstairs, a part of the premises of this said Silver, actually produced such likenesses by spiritual means. Upon this statement and being further told that he could have such a picture taken for $10, it being stated in connection with the price given that money was no object, 
but that the price was so fixed because the spirits did, li- did not like a throng, and that to exclude the vulgar multitude, the price was fixed at so high a rate. Wow. They don't like the pores. <laughs> <laughs> and silver also reciting a multitude of instances of their being taken and the high value placed on them, the marshal arranged to have his picture taken. He specified that he wanted taken with his photograph the spirit likeness of his deceased father-in-law. This could not be promised, but that of the person nearer in sympathy with the deponent at the time of taking the picture. The marshal wanted to know if a spirit likeness would be guaranteed. Mr. Silver said there was sometimes a failure, but it looked like a person who would be successful in the operation. First, a deposit of $5 was demanded, but this was finally reproduced to $2. Meanwhile, a lady who had been moving mysteriously about, the moment the money was paid, left the room and went upstairs. Pretty soon, he was shown upstairs having been told that this lady was a spirit medium and wife of the spirit photographer Mumler. This Mr. Mumler stated that he produced spirit likenesses and that no other person could take such wonderful pictures and that he, Mumler, challenged the skeptical world to produce similar miraculous productions. The conversation was kept up for some time. The marshal was asked if he understood the photographic art and on answering that he did not, he was taken into a dark room where Mr. Mumler pretended to demonstrate the truthfulness of his assertions and the wonderful power to produce spirit pictures. At length, the picture was taken, a fair picture of himself, and also on it a faint outline of a man's face. Mr. Tooker, who, by the way, had given the name of Benedict, was asked if he recognized the likeness. Mr. Tooker failed to recognize the face. Mr. Mumler directed him to think of the matter seriously, and he would come to recognize the face as that of, that of some relative or friend. Mr. Does it begin with a P? <laughs> Mr. Mumler enlarged on this point of recognition. They had produced surprising effects. Ladies had fainted. Mr. Tooker was to call next day for his pictures. He did call the next day, paid the balance of the $10, and received his pictures with the unknown gentleman faintly visible in the background. He took a dozen pictures, such as would ordinarily cost $3, and had a bill made out for them, the specification of charge being to one dozen spirit photographs $10. The remainder of the affidavit, altogether covering 11 closely written pages of fool's cap, contained a detailed statement of Mr. Tucker's visits to the photographic gallery of Mr. Rockwood, number 839 Broadway, and having a precisely similar photograph taken, which was not the result of any spiritual or supernatural agency, and so distinctly avowed, having therefore satisfied himself that these pretended spirit photographs are only the result of ordinary scientific and chemical means, he charged Mumler and Silver alias William Gray, with having, by false pretense, defrauded and cheated him out of the sum of $10 in lawful money of the United States. P.V. Hickey, in an affidavit covering seven pages, recites the details of this investigation in the case. His attention was first called to the matter at a meeting of the scientific branch of the American Institute. He accordingly repaired to Mr. Mumler's place on Broadway. He met there several gentlemen and ladies, some of whom showed likenesses they had had taken with pretended spirit likenesses of the same. Some would not part with these likenesses for a thousand dollars. An elderly man was particularly zealous of the subject. He did not have his picture taken. The parties became suspicious of him, and he stated further that he had been informed prior to his visit that Mumler had practiced similar deceptions in Boston until he could no longer remain there. He felt it his duty to expose the affair, and therefore called on Mayor Hall, who referred him to Marshal Tooker. He charges Mumler with obtaining money by false pretense or by trick and device, and asks that he be dealt with according to law. Oscar G. Mason, in his affidavit, states that he is secretary of the photographical section of the American Institute and for 20 years has been theoretically and practically connected with the photographic business. He had examined the photographic likenesses of Mr. Tooker with the alleged spirit face on them. Such pictures, he stated, could be produced by several processes, in which use by this profession. He pronounces these pretended spirit photographs as impositions and gives as his opinion that such evil and wicked disposed persons should be dealt with as by law provided. Mr. Charles Boyle, practical photographer, confirms the allegations of Mr. Mason. What have you got to say to these charges? inquired Judge Dowling of the prisoners after the reading of the affidavits. I have nothing to say now, answered Mr. Mumler. Do you pretend to say, pursued the judge, that you take spirit photographs by supernatural means. Have no answer to make to this question either, replied Mr. Mumler. I demand an examination. How about Mr. Silver, interrogated the magistrate. I have nothing to do with the establishment, spoke up the gentleman alluded to. That's so, interrupted Mr. Mumler. I bought him out on the 9th of March. 
That's not the Mr. Silver I saw at number 630 Broadway and referred to in my affidavit, observed Marshall Tooker. You had better find that stray piece of silver, observed the judge, and the quicker the better, this is probably a counterfeit. It was finally arranged to hold Mr. Mumler in $500 bail to appeal for examination on Friday. Mr. Silver was released on his own recognizance to appear at the time stated. So this is, again, 1869. 1869. And they were already getting to the bottom of this. Yeah, it's been debunked. It's official. It's official. It's the nature of uh, nature of many things. The nature of people. The nature of... Uh, the want of belief. The, the want to belief, sure. Yeah. I get many, many photos of what look like leaves to me. But people insist our faces of Bigfoot or Dogman or whatever other creature. I try to be kind. I try not to hurt people's feelings. It's not my place to be the, the skeptic. There's enough skeptics out there. But I do say, I don't see what you're telling me is there, but I wasn't there. You're the one who took the picture. But there are groups, there are Bigfoot groups on Facebook where people put up pictures like this constantly. Constantly. This is a bunch of leaves. Leaves and shadows. And you would be surprised at the number of people who comment, oh yes, I see it. I see it. And the joke I always make, in private, you know, Mm -hmm. with friends, I won't actually put the comment on the photo. But I always say, and it's holding a baby. (laughs) Because you would be surprised at how many people... You know, somebody will say, like, like they'll put a red circle around whatever area that's supposed to be a creature. And then somebody else in the comments will, like, put another circle on the left side. You know, say, that's on the right side. That'll be on the right side. Like, you missed one. There's one here. You know, and then somebody else is like, yes, and it's holding a baby. It's like, oh, my goodness. Hey, maybe they're there. And, I, and those people have magic Bigfoot sight. But for the most part, mm-hmm. they're not there. They're, they're, they're just a bunch of leaves. And, that, and people are are putting this up as absolute evidence and and a bunch of people are supporting them and if somebody uh somebody comes out against it they'll be gang jumped on like you know who are you to say this and you know blah 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 blah, blah et cetera et cetera so without making any judgments maybe i just don't see it you know i was never good at those magic eye 3d things can't make yeah them ironically out. i can do those <laughs> So may- maybe I just don't have the magic eye to make the Bigfoots pop out of the picture the way that, that, that they do. <laughs> Take, remove that from <laughs> the fact that there's so many people getting in line. You know what I mean? To say, absolutely. Yes, I see it. I see what you're talking about. And in fact, I see another one here. You know, it's this... But you want to believe in Bigfoot, don't you? I don't have to want to. I believe in Bigfoot. I don't believe in an ape in the woods, but I believe in Bigfoot. It's another point. It's another mm-hmm. story. That's another argument for another day. I'm just saying it's interesting how it's still we we have a modern version of that now. Those in the art in that article you just read, those some of those people they said would not part with those photographs. They wanted to believe no matter what. Well, they I mean that they thought it was their connection to a dead loved one. Right. So of course they were going to want to keep those photographs. They don't want to believe that it's a hoax in the same way that no one wants to hear that the psychic. Or the medium has someone else who's overheard a conversation and reports things back or right. or is just playing on your emotional yeah. losses and yeah. vulnerability. Right, right. But I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's a very similar. It's, it's, it's mirrored in modern things still today. And, and to me, it's the, the leaves that people are, you know, a number of people are all agreeing. Yes, this is real. You know, someone has said this is real. A number of people get right in line. But yeah, I see it. I see what you're saying. Whatever that means, psychologically. You know what I mean? Maybe all these people just want Bigfoot to be real. The, the way those people wanted ghosts to be real or those, those spirits. Whatever the case, it's mirrored in today, which, which I find very interesting. I don't know what way to wrap this up other than that, as I said, it seems like, you know, so much has changed and yet so much is still the same. And I would be careful of, uh, personally, I'd be careful of any, any uh, photographic claims of the paranormal and I know you're going to say, you just take photographic claims out of that. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or even just, I'd be careful. Well, there you go. So thanks for listening, everybody. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, darkhollerarts.com. We do music, books, podcasts, and more. Including photographs.
If you're on Facebook, check out the Strange Familiars Facebook group. It's called Strange Familiars Gathering. Go ahead, send a membership request and join and take part in the fun. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. Go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. my mind. 